Well, assalamu alaikum and greetings from Pakistan. And thanks so much, Alice, uh, and Architecture Foundation for the opportunity to participate in this remarkable series, actually, uh, of webinars by architects. I don't think it's ever happened before, of course. This allows me to once again discuss my barefoot social architecture, or Baza, for short, as I did earlier, as you said, at the Barbican, just before the lockdown. And uh, the world has changed so much since that time, of course. And perhaps Baza makes more sense now when so many countries are facing an economic downturn with rising levels of poverty and inequality and a quest for egalitarianism in the aftermath of COVID-19. A virus that does not differentiate between the haves and the have-nots. It does not guarantee life because of your status or wealth or how many designer objects you might possess. It reminds us that we all need to assume the guardianship of Earth's resources and use our creative potential to fashion an equitable world. Those who are aware of my work know that for 36 years, as a practicing architect, barring a few projects, I had indulged in an extravagant egotistic journey, which focused on serving the elite of my country. But this is how we are trained in schools of architecture even today, I believe. Even though the imperatives of the world require us to explore alternative ways of practicing architecture. Today, I will not be showing any pictures of my prima donna phase, although for many lectures in the past, I did so. I remember that in 2016, I was invited by RIBA to deliver a lecture, which coincided with the model of my bamboo women's center on stilts being displayed at the exhibition called Rising from Catastrophe. A distinct honor to be exhibited alongside sketches of a great master such as Christopher Wren. Before the lecture, a BBC correspondent called me and asked me about the theme of the lecture. I told him I will be talking about my work in earth and bamboo. The journalist scoffed at me and warned me that perhaps I was not aware the audience will consist of many eminent architects. And did I think this topic would be of any interest to them? So for the last several years, as I discussed my barefoot models, I felt I needed to establish my credibility to skeptical audiences around the world by showing snippets of my iconic buildings fashioned out of reinforced concrete, steel and reflective glass. I'm pleased to tell you that I do not feel the need to do this anymore. As so many in many countries have become familiar with my barefoot theme advocating the case for social and ecological justice by lowering the carbon footprint in structures. In my nine lectures in two months of lockdowns, six in Pakistan, India, uh, one in India, one in Sri Lanka and Oman, over 6,000 professionals from 21 countries logged in the webinars. And in early June, a BBC Urdu news segment about my current work received 1.7 million hits. It encourages me to think that perhaps architects are rethinking their role in a changing world. I must also thank the organizers of uh, Jane Drew Prize that Alice just mentioned for granting uh, respectability to my current work. As I said on the occasion earlier this year, it was wonderful that the prize equalized both star and barefoot architecture which I hope would transform perceptions and mindsets regarding how architects and architecture need to deal with the complexities driven by a post-colonial world order, something that is brought into even a sharper focus due to the current pandemic. So I'll try to start my slides now and let's see whether I managed to do this. Let's see, um, where are my slides? There we are. Okay. I to see that if I can maximize it. I'm still learning about this, you know, it's just a little bit tricky. So my presentation is going to be in three parts. Uh, first, why barefoot social architecture or BASA? Then what is barefoot social architecture? And thirdly, zero carbon approaches and eco-urbanism. So, uh, but first, uh, I'd just like to talk a little bit about uh, Heritage Foundation of Pakistan. Uh, uh, I wanted to show you how my humanitarian architecture has fostered low carbon techniques in heritage conservation, while vernacular traditions of my country have helped devise strategies for the marginalized. On the left, you see the amazing 16th century Timuri tomb that we conserved at Makli World Heritage Site, the largest Muslim necropolis in the world. On the right is the reconstructed earth masonry structure that we helped built after countrywide floods of 2010, decorated by the rural housewife. So let's take the first part, which is why barefoot social architecture. I want really to provide you with the context which has led me to devise this particular stratagem. So um, you can see this is 
Pakistan has this amazing, it really is the custodian of rich and diverse heritage dating back to Bronze Age. I've sought inspiration from this amazing legacy in order to work out low-cost sustainable methodologies that resonate with the aspirations of marginalized communities in my country. Secondly, Pakistan also is among those nations that are struggling to keep up with the SDGs, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, because of high poverty levels and low levels of education and healthcare. And then, thirdly, it happens to be among the highest vulnerable countries with recurring disasters as a result of climate change, as it lies on several fault lines and in the path of immense melting glaciers. Now, I also wanted to share with you um, the environmental impact of, of construction that's going around all over the world. So you can see the, change, the damage to the environment due to the use of popular industrialized materials that are used in modern construction around the world. You can see 40% world energy is being used. And if you look at steel and cement, you can see how high the levels of energy consumption are. And then um, this, uh, I want to just show you as an expensive international urbanized model that is uh, you know, given out to uh, you know, countries which, which uh, especially like Pakistan, disasters occur. And this is really very expensive and very inappropriate for the vast majority who are affected by disasters. On the, on the right, you see a kind of calculation if 100,000 units were built, we would have, you know, lost 50,770 acres of forest land. So uh, you can see how much damage even big causes. And then, um, since I've been working with international organizations, uh, uh, you can see that, you know, these 15 years that I was, I was there with them, working with them uh, for providing humanitarian assistance into hundreds of thousands of displaced people, I realized that the present international aid system and the Western charity models are entirely unsuitable and must be discarded. And that's why Baza had to come into being. Uh, you can see the charity uh, fosters dependency, this promotion of alien imagery, lack of appropriate knowledge and tools, women are left behind, and high administrative costs, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, there's this whole issue of... Uh, uh, of uh, Sorry, yes. uh, of social justice and, and humanist architecture that is very close to me. I really feel that this is something that we have to, we have to use architecture really to uh, provide justice in, in the world. And so uh, a question that I raise now with architects around the world, beginning at Sixth Portland Place in 2016 at, and at McGill University in Montreal, at RMIT in Melbourne, Fukuoka in Tokyo in Japan in public, public lectures, at Oslo and Vienna Biennale, Victoria and Albert Museums in London and Dundee, Battersea Art Center and your own uh, you know, architecture on stage at the Barbican, and scores of other assemblies and webinar lectures. And I would like to ask the distinguished participants of this webinar, should architects continue to be an instrument in the hands of the 1% who the famous French economist Thomas Piketty says have accumulated the most wealth? And must we continue creating star architecture for the select few, however much damage it may cause to the earth? Must we maintain the present modes of living and building that are resulting in accelerated depletion of the planet's resources, especially in view of rising disparities within our societies and everywhere in the world, really, whether it's the first world or the third? The impact of global warming, climate change, emergencies, and recurring disasters climate change, migrants, and conflict-impelled camps for the displaced and now the economic impact of COVID-19. On the one hand, the scenario appears chaotic and unmanageable. On the other, it opens up untold prospects to create design alternatives for fulfilling the emergent needs of the planet. As a result, I have stumbled upon numerous design opportunities unclaimed before, just in the pursuit of fulfilling the exigencies of social and ecological well-being. So learning from Pakistan's pre-industrial vernacular heritage, I realized that design is not a standalone activity. It must be underpinned by considerations of social impact and ecological sustainability. I also understood that where there are greater deficits, you need more design, not less. And it is only good design that can fulfill the void. We need more designers working in this field. Today, my life's mission is to find ways to build for the other 99% of our populations as well as help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the dictum I follow is low cost, zero carbon footprint, zero waste. So um, I just wanted to show you the impact of Baza. Um, uh, through this mechanism, we've been able to reach out to something like 0.84 million people or over 100,000 persons per year through provision of basic needs. We have been able to work towards 12 of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, but it's still a drop in the ocean. So uh, now we come to the second part, which is what is barefoot social architecture of Baza. 
So Baza is a result of my struggle over the last so many years to articulate a people's humanistic architecture as part of rights-based development, incorporating attributes of social and ecological justice. The Baza is akin to social engineering for bringing about social change, incorporating environmental, cultural, and technical dimensions, resulting in transformation of mindsets from a cycle of dependency to a culture of pride and self-reliance. On the one hand, Baza seeks to democratize architecture and provides people with well-being and self-esteem. On the other, it has partiality for zero carbon footprint, using ubiquitous earth, conservatives, ma magic lime, and renewable bamboo. Now, Baza actually has, it has four tenets. Uh, first, maximizing the potential of the barefoot ecosystem. Secondly, zero carbon humanistic architecture, fostering pride uh, uh, and dignity and well-being. And then thirdly, delivery of unmet needs through something called barefoot incubator that I have devised. And then fourthly, non-engineered structures for shrinking the ecological footprint. So I'll run uh, these uh, through these four tenets um, as part of my second part of my presentation. So here we are, the Baza tenet number one, which is maximizing the potential of barefoot ecosystem. Here is the wide ranging ecosystem in this graphics, you can see, with the bare, it's barefoot economy, um, if I can get my cursor here. Uh, it, it then has the barefoot market, it has barefoot enterprises, barefoot entrepreneurs, barefoot services, and also barefoot products. And uh, unfortunately though, uh, the barefoot ecosystem prevalent in less developed countries of LDCs or least developed countries has uh, uh, been overlooked by economists and politicians alike. But according to my findings, it can function as a parallel economy as long as an enabling process of serving and sharing with the other disadvantaged populace is ensured. And this is what we have to do somehow that we put people to work who can then try to make things or make products for the other poor. Now, I come now to the Basa tenet number two, which is a uh, uh, zero carbon humanistic architecture, which fosters pride and so on. And in my work now, I really follow two gurus. There's the Lime, Lime Guru, Marcus Vitorubrius, and then there's Earth Guru, which is, as you can see, Hassan Fatihi. And let's look at, um, uh, let's look at uh, Marcus Vitorubrius. I'm bound by his four elements of air, water, earth, and fire as limits of architecture. The alchemy of natural elements addresses the bounds of sustainability, spanning the spheres of economic, social, moral, and cultural aspects. I believe that use of these elements leads us to the confines of democratic norms and behavior. And then there's Hassan Bey, the great uh, Egyptian architect of last century. And as Hassan Bey would have it, I'm also conscious at all times of the obligation to be close to nature and to the people and to traverse a path which would unleash the creativity of Congo. Using their intangible reserves of ancient wisdom, they must as they are in their folklore, oral histories and craft traditions, the so-called vernacular expression. And then uh, this is my palette. Uh, as far as my work is concerned, I consider myself an advocate of earth, lime and bamboo, as I said earlier, as among the most sustainable materials, which are the only materials I use in my work. As you might be aware, as you can see on the graphic on the, on the left, clay does not have to be burnt in fire to attain strength. The combination of earth, water and sunlight provides a building material of great value. The ever-present earth is most freely available and one that is most used around the world, but by the poor. The second material, as you can see in the center, is lime. It is hewn as a rock where which the alchemy of fire transforms into an unparalleled force that has provided strength to the Roman aqueducts and the impregnable 15th century Timurid forts. Once common earth and lime are mixed together, uh, but water provides a strength that cannot be surpassed by any other material and the least by Portland cement. And the third material on the left, on the right is bamboo, which is among the most important elements for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Nurtured by soil and water, it has incomparable characteristics. It provides a crop every two to three years and is among the largest renewable sources. And uh, some examples of humanistic architecture as a result of co-building. Uh, you can see that, um, uh, you know, when, they, when people build themselves and they add to them, you know, how beautiful everything can become. And you can see how women are decorating their safe shelters. They are, they are only earth and, and, uh, and bamboo, but they are extremely safe. They withstood lots of floods by this time. And then, uh, of course, we have these, uh, uh, this is also echo architecture for identity and dignity. And you can see the unique imagery that is applied on them. And then the third example I want to show is the World Habitat winner, the Pakistan Chula Stove. 
and uh, it's with its ornamentation. Over 60,000 have been built and each is a designer chula store with, with really unique ornamentation. So you can see why I can no longer claim to be the author of my works. I do create a blank canvas, but it is the participatory process that motivates ordinary people to utilize their creativity, particularly women who transform these into works of art. So now we come to the third uh, tenet of PASA, which is delivery of unmet needs through this something called the Barefoot Incubator for Social Good and, and uh, Environmental Sustainability. Uh, the incubator helps to train, monitor, and mentor the poorest communities to fabricate products for the other poor in order to fulfill their unmet needs. I just wanted to show the center where this training takes place. This is the you know, Carbon Cultural Center called ZC3. I just also wanted to show you uh, an image of the accommodation that we have there. We've put up trainees as well as our uh, distinguished delegates that come for conferences. And uh, uh, this is uh, this, uh, the bamboo structure I showed you is huge. It's a marquee, which is about 57 feet wide and 80 feet long and 27 feet high, the one that I showed you earlier. And uh, uh, you can see how the training goes on within that particular marquee with lots of, uh, lots of women who, have, who learn about doing things. They, are all, they all belong to mendicant or beggar communities uh, around the area. And uh, here is um, a whole range of products that are needed for the poor, whether it's shelter or water or uh, stove or, or, or sanitation. Yeah, these are all needed and there's a deficit of millions of these all around the world and also in Pakistan. And they have to be really available at, at, uh, at affordable prices if you want everybody to have these. But these are, this is the market that exists. And then um, under the incubator program last year, Training for green skills and craft products was carried out with support from British Council and University of Glasgow, where each of the eight villages has specialized one in one kind of green product. Within 12 months, 70% of 230 incubators have risen above the poverty line. And you can see they're all very simple things, all green, green products, and, and, and uh, they're selling well around the area. And even during lockdowns and restrictions on travel, 50% of them have been able to earn a living by selling inexpensive locally manufactured products within poor communities. Case for local manufacturing when everything shuts down during the pandemic. So um, this is, I just wanted to show you uh, what kind of products are being made and you can see that, and they are all being sold around uh, within poor communities also. Uh, this is actually, I just wanted to show you that the uh, market doubles up in international conference center as well, and this is the last year Interval conference held in November 2019 by Interval Pakistan. So, and I'm, I'm very happy there are so many of those who were attended the conference are actually here today with us. Now we come to uh, tenet number four, which is non-engineered structures for shrinking the ecological footprint. And you can see this one, which is uh, again, a very simple earth, you know, earth uh, walls and, and, and bamboo roofs. And uh, this one has placed Pakistan in the lead as the largest zero carbon shelter program in the world. As you see, no carbon emissions, no trees were felled, 1750 villages and 300,000 persons were housed. And uh, then we come to this particular one. This is a, I wanted to show the animation here because uh, um, this is actually a prefabricated bamboo panel, uh, which can be packed and sent anywhere. And it can be actually you know, used in many different configurations so it starts off with an octagon room, uh, 12 by 12 foot, which we normally give out to the poor. And uh, uh, then if you add on a couple more panels to it, uh, then uh, you can make it into a kind of a classroom somewhere in a village. And uh, if you also, again, you uh, put some more panels to it, uh, as you will see, um, and then this becomes a, you know, a kind of a community center in a village, 18 foot, 18 foot by 18 foot room with a dome. And, and so on. And then uh, it can all again be uh, more units can be uh, this modular so you can attach more of them. And when they do, then it becomes the interval center, which is uh, this one here. So this is the non engineered zero carbon interval training and resource center built using prefabricated bamboo panels, as I showed you. It is dedicated to His Royal Highness Prince Charles in acknowledgement of his support to our work as he himself is a great proponent of zero carbon structures. So you see it's nothing but bamboo and mud and thatch. And this is uh, the last example that I want to show you of, of uh, non-engineered structures. Uh, this is something which is again made with mud brick, but it has a, um, a bamboo lattice built into it. And 
uh, this was tested because nobody would believe that it will, uh, you know, withstand an earthquake. So the simulation of Kobe earthquake of 7.3 Richter scale were carried out in Karachi at the NAD University, starting with 25% going up to 100% and nothing happened. Then 125% to, you know, to 275%, nothing happened. And finally, they wanted to break it. So I'll just, I'll just like to show you this. I'm sorry if some of you might have seen it earlier, but this I have to show because I, I need to show everybody that mud and lime and bamboo can really do well. So this is like a, you know, like actual Gobi earthquake. You see nothing happened to it. This is going up to 275%. And you see again, no crack, nothing. Uh, this is because the bamboo that is in there is so dense. And the twice chances said we've got to break it. So this is now 670%. And um, uh, I don't think hopefully in our lifetime we'll be never in the earthquake like this, but if they was, then, uh, you know, then save your life because uh, it did not collapse. It did not collapse. And uh, that's the value of these materials, and you can see how that worked out. So, all right, so this is all about Vaza. Now let's move on to uh, zero carbon approaches and eco urbanism. So I'd like to present some of the lessons from the past, which I believe can help mitigate global warming. And uh, I'd like to show you this uh, particular one, which is the, I'm sorry, uh, this is the wind catcher. Uh, this is a uh, zero energy wind cooling can be attained by the unidirectional wind catcher of Tata. This is a very famous town in Sin, where I come from, where incoming breeze provides thermal control, air movement, as well as warm air exhaust, and the coverage of the book that I wrote in the uh, 80s. Uh, and then uh, there's another one uh, which I'd like to show you, which is, uh, why is it not moving? Yeah. This is uh, um, a beautiful house in Tower up in North and uh, uh, and most amazing uh, kind of crafts in this. This is zero energy thermal comfort is achieved by utilizing passive solar design and thermal mass. The courtyard helps store cool air during the night, keeping the interiors cool for much of the day. And you can see through the graphics how it works. And then, yeah, okay. So these are among the best examples of zero energy water cooling. Uh, this is on the left is the Paradise El Chahar Bagh or uh, Paradise Garden of World Heritage Shalamar with spectacular water displays creating a cool environment entirely by natural means. Water is also used in the Paradise El Quadrants, the Shishmal, which is the Lahore Fort on the right. So, uh, so this is, these are the lessons I feel, and there must be so many in so many countries around the world that we really should be looking at, I believe. Uh, and the next slide that I'll show you is about, uh, uh, this is about traditional sustainable urbanism. So in my view, New York with its highest infection rate and its high carbon, high density, glittering skyscrapers will no longer be the urbanist future beacon. And as we get accustomed to carrying out business mostly, I'm optimistic that eco-urbanism will take root, drawing upon age-old wisdom and traditional environment found in countries such as Pakistan aiming for low rise, medium density formations with open to sky terraces for families to remain in contact with nature when a pandemic strikes with pedestrian enclaves and local round the corner shopping without being disrupted by vehicular traffic. Such attributes as you see on the left can lead our cities towards low carbon resilience and enable us to help contain emissions to within 1.5 degrees centigrade rise requirement by COP21, if you remember, it was held in, in Paris Agreement of 2015. And then uh, if you look at uh, the traditional urbanism, uh, which I believe equals ecological urbanism, we should be aware that being responsible for 65 to 70% of greenhouse gas emissions, our urban centers will remain global warming bat battlegrounds unless urban professionals devise ways to convert them into eco cities. We have seen that traditional urbanism is a result of local wisdom, use of sustainable materials and techniques for minimizing the use of energy. Many of us believe that there is a need to transform our present wasteful urban centers into low carbon eco enclaves. So as you can see, compact cities, uh, you know, not urban sprawls, low rise, medium density, mixed use developments, vehicle free walkable enclaves, greenery and water bodies. I mean, these are all things that we all know about and we just have to put them all together uh, and, and hopefully we get a much better uh, living environments. So this, I will finish my slides here and uh, I'd like to just 
a few things now further. So um, uh, we really need to be now looking at you know, what we need to do a post COVID-19 world, uh, and especially us who are professionals who are involved in all kinds of buildings and construction and all and the rest of it. So my offerings are by way of drawing attention to the fundamental role of design in achieving a better quality of life for marginalized sections and the need for architects to be in the forefront of innovations for lowering the carbon footprint. The implications of COVID-19 exhort us to move towards a society that is humanistic and inclusive. Together, we must endeavor to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as we fashion a new urban environment based on more sustainable lifestyles, adopting movements such as transition design, degrowth, or low carbon compact cities, which are becoming popular in the West, and my own bazaar for sustenance of the disadvantaged in the third world. And as I conclude, I would like to leave a thought with the distinguished participants of this webinar. As built environment professionals, are we ready to play a role in mending the imbalances in this world and stitching this highly damaged earth tapestry? Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Yes, it's been sensational. Um, what an inspiring presentation. Um, if we have quite a few um, people here, we'd love to hear, well, we'd love to hear more from you all. So if you have questions or comments, just pitch them in the chat box and I'll, I'll come to you. Um, but I'd like to kick off by um, asking um, Murad Jamil to, um, to talk. Murad um, is a distinguished architect from Islamabad and uh, co-founder um, of in, uh, Pakistan. I know he's been involved recently in a couple of initiatives which are really directed at um, expanding the kind of the um, expanding the the kind of um, thinking that we've been hearing about um, both at an, educa at an educational and professional level. Um, Murad, could you could you tell us a little bit about your work in relation to the ideas we've just been hearing about? Uh, we need to unmute you, Murad. So. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you, Ellis, for inviting me to your 100-day studio pa panel by the Architects Foundation. Greetings to everyone here. Uh, I don't think I can add much to Architect Lari's uh, presentation because of its being so wholesome and comprehensive. Yet what I would like to um, uh, talk about is uh, that um, we as a team are reinforcing her with her work and her thought process that she's, she's been uh, doing for the past two decades in Pakistan. Um, so um, we ran an, an online uh, lecture series uh, comprising of six lectures in collaboration with the Institute of Architects Pakistan headed by Fazia Asad of um, Rawalpindi Islamabad chapter with her team backed by the president of Institute of Architects Pakistan. So those six lectures um, talked about her methodology, uh, zero carbon methodology. Um, and, and she um, ran uh, them through the, the audience and students and architects. And there were actually quite a few people logged in from um, in, uh, different countries of the world. Um, so those six lectures uh, talked about her zero carbon methodology mostly uh, what you saw in her presentation of bamboo, lime, and earth, and um, how to lower the carbon uh, emission in, in structures. So at the conclusion of those six lectures, um, IEP with admin and Intpal initiated a competition in Pakistan for all architects and all and, and architecture students to come up with their own design um, solutions and themes based on uh, architect Lari's doctrine. And so that competition is on right now. And what we will do is we're going to uh, reinforce it further by putting up the winning design entry whoever wins the design, we're going to put up that structure in that area to promote it further. So we're going to, as as Intbau uh, team, International Network for Traditional Building and um, uh, Urbanism, Heritage Urbanism, sorry, Urbanism, uh, we, we're going to fund that uh, project here. And uh, so it, it gets promoted. 
And uh, that's one of the initiatives that Indipow is doing that we're going to run this competition. We're going to put up that um, winning design um, structure. And um, also at the inception of Intbao in Pakistan, which Harriet Wenberg helped create in Pakistan, the chapter, uh, we held a conference in Matli. Um, every, we had lots of delegates from all over the world, UNESCO, Habitat, Intbao chapters, including Harriet. They came and saw the Yasmin Lari's work up close and personal, and, and they went through a few workshops, the real hands-on experience of how to put this thing together, her methodologies. So there were workshops there, and we ran them through those workshops. Currently, we're working with um, the Board of Architectural Education, and the Institute of Architects uh, and, and the Pakistan Council of Architects in Pakistan, how her methodologies can be incorporated into the curricula of some, like some 35 architecture schools that we have back home. So we are working on that right now. In addition, um, Yasmin Lari is working in Makli with her team. And and lots of architects, we, we, we are packing it up as, as a team of Interbau and Admin and IAP, all three institutions, that she's putting up those tutorials, video tutorials for people to be able to put up these shelters in their areas on a self-help basis. So that's our next step and that's what's, what's being done right now to promote her zero carbon methodology and it's picking up a lot here. And we are also thinking of connecting with the government to make a presentation to them and see how they can work with around her, her, her methodology of zero carbon approach. So that's um, what how we are assisting her, her. So thank you for allowing me to reinforce her here. Back to you, Ellis. Thank you, Murad. Um, perhaps we should hear next from Harriet uh, Wenberg as um, Harriet's the executive director of Intbao. Um, I mean, Harriet, I'd be particularly, yeah, you obviously have a global scope with you know, chapters across the world, and I'd be suddenly interested to know if the, the kind of lessons that um, are coming out of the um, Pakistan chapter have, a, have an application more broadly in your program. That's a very good question. Thanks, Alas. No, I'm very, very happy to, to be here and always to hear from Yasmin. I think we're saying yesterday for two reasons that are putting us at risk of being glad there's a pandemic on. It's having the 100 day studio and all the amazing content that's, that's come forward from that. And also having Yasmin's work and messages actually being able to be broadcast to a much wider kind of global audience is a, is a great thing. Um, so as Moad was saying, I was really lucky to be out at Makri last November um, and that we now have the Intbao Centre that is there and um, the hope being that once things are back to more of a normal state and travel is possible to be able to have groups from within Pakistan but also uh, internationally to come for workshops on site there and to learn from, um, from the local community members who are now expert practitioners in all of these building craft fields and the making of, of um, the stuff of life, really. So um, to the point, yeah, that LSU were asking of, of the applicability sort of more globally, we, that every Intbao chapter is set up to, um, within their country to be trying to push for precisely what, uh, what Yasmin is trying to do. So ways of building in a way that is adapted to climate and context and building on you know, these generations of, of knowledge that are often there uh, in a way that's gentler on the planet too. So to, to build on the initiative, Murad was mentioning the design competition within Pakistan. Um, Intbao later this year is going to be launching a, a global design challenge, the New Growth Architecture Challenge, we'll be calling it, that will be looking for um, these really low or no carbon solutions, building on occasionally vernacular precedent or just working with um, replenishable natural local materials, local construction skill um, to design housing that would then be safe and resilient and adaptable around the world. Um, so I think the main challenge, um, well, one of, one of the challenges that faces, but quite a big one, is that the 
work Yasmin is, is doing and the exceptional impact that has had, you know, we need globally much more of that and on a bigger scale, we need to tap scale. So we need the skill, we need the, the knowledge, we need the, um, the sort of the, the sharing of the models that could work to be adapted for um, different local places and, and scaled up. Um, so I think the, um, you know, the chapter in Pakistan is doing really pretty extraordinary things and much of the rest of the Inbound Network is kind of looking to them to, to learn from what's being done there and what Yasmin and the team around her have, have achieved. Thank you, Harriet. Um, I'm next going to um, come over to Zurich, where <laughs> Helen Thomas is uh, joining us. Helen's just a recent, I don't, I'm not sure if it's published yet, but Helen's written a, a beautiful piece about Yasmin's work, um, really in relation to the subject of technology for, for Domus, uh, which some of uh, David Chipperfield is currently guest editor of. Um, Helen, do you have kind of some observations about what you've just heard, or do you have a kind of question for uh, Yasmin that you, you'd like well, to? Hello, Yasmin. Um, it's great to see you. Um, well, I mean, I really enjoyed your talk, um, and it's quite amazing that in the period between when you did your talk at the your live talk at the Architecture Foundation and today, you've already been. You know, it's quite new material, and I, I mean, well, as you were talking at the beginning about the. Um, the uh, implications of lockdown and how it's changed how we think about um, um, where we live. Um, I was wondering, you know, what does Yasmin think about the city? So when you started to talk about eco-urbanism at the end of your talk, I think, yay, that's so interesting. I mean, I found that, and you know, because that's really what I'm quite curious about, because all, in a way, when you started to, in 2005, when you, were, you started to work in disaster areas, you, you moved from the city into a rural environment and you know and you've do, and, and experimented with the barefoot social architecture using the, the existing barefoot economies that, that already existed in the rural environment um, and developed a whole set of zero carbon material technologies and ways of using the vernacular and I was wondering and you, and you started to do it you started to connect your heritage work from the city to um, the, the work that you've been doing in the rural environment. I was wondering, you know, what, what do you think the future of cities is, which I, I think you've started to answer. And also, you know, are some of these ideas about technology that you developed in a rural environment, and I'm, I'm thinking about the material technologies, with the bamboo and the lime, um, and the organizational technologies, are they transferable to an urban environment, do you think? Yeah. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it's very interesting how I think, uh, you know, somehow we always felt or kept uh, rural uh, techniques and technologies separate from the urban ones. And somehow the whole effort has been to transfer what we, uh, what we implement in urban areas to try to take it to rural areas. I think the time has come to reverse the trend because there's just so much there that can be actually gainfully used, be gainfully used by, by, by urban centers. And really, um, in terms of uh, some of the work that's being done with my uh, beggar communities, uh, like uh, low carbon uh, terracotta, uh, uh, you know, ties that are being made, they're going to be transferred to, to Karachi, in, uh, you know, to show, uh, you know, the city of Karachi that you don't have to use concrete everywhere. I think we have to really try to see where we can start lowering carbon footprint. And there's a, there are a lot of lessons there that we can apply to urban areas as well. So yeah, we, I'm hoping that things, I mean, people I think hopefully will be more uh, receptive to these ideas now after, after COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So there may be a silver lining there. There may be that, yes. Yeah, and I, and I really liked in your talk the way you used um, your investigations into um, the, the vernacular architecture of SATA and started to uh, reinterpret it in the urban environment. And it actually reminded me, um, I, I was in email communication with one of your, um, Western collaborators, Eva Vecchi, um, and she was talking about how she visited Pata with you and looked at um, uh, uh, this, these cooling systems and how together you, um, even if it's one of your star architecture uh, buildings, that you embodied some of those ideas from the vernacular, even at that point within, within, your, within your building. So, you know, it's very interesting. It's a long time, yeah, it's been a long struggle, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, thank you, Helen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, it was very kind. Um, 
we've also got Ollie Wainwright, uh, 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 Guardian uh, yes. Architecture Critic, scourge of um, iconic Hello. architecture. <laughs> Uh, Hello, Ali. How are you? <laughs> hey, Yasmin. I'm very well. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk once again. And I'd just like to echo what Helen said, seeing how much you've been doing since we saw you in London. It's incredibly <laughs> inspiring. Um, and I have to say, I'm actually a huge fan of what you always call your, your architect prima donna phase. I think anyone, um, any member of the audience who's not familiar with the Pakistan State Oil House should go and look it up. It's a magnificent kind of monument to the the oil age of the 1990s. Um, I suppose throughout, whenever I hear you talk, I always try and think, you know, how could these principles be adopted here? And how, how does the barefoot model translate into to a context like London or the UK? Um, and it's very difficult to come up with an answer. I suppose, you know, what, one answer could be, you know, do we adopt more kind of self-build strategies? Do we start to try and use as many kind of uh, locally sourced materials as possible? But I think actually, our kind of version of, of what you're doing is to, to preserve and keep as many existing buildings as we have at the moment and yeah. use the built environment that we have as the kind of material resource. Um, and I think it's particularly kind of poignant that you're giving this talk today, because I don't know if you're aware, but the Conservative government this morning just unveiled a complete overhaul of the UK with the English planning system, um, meaning that from now on any office building or industrial building built before 1990 can be demolished um, without any kind of planning permission and you can build an apartment block in its place. So just at a time when architects are finally waking up to the need to, to retain as much existing structure as possible because of the issues of embodied carbon, the Conservative government is doing everything possible to, to prevent that from happening and to allow um, landowners and building owners to demolish whatever they have and, and build um, brand new buildings. So yeah, I, I guess um, your, your message of, um, of, of kind of preserve what we have needs to be broadcast uh, as loud and as far as possible, I would say. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I think what I feel is really that um, I think the methodologies can be different, but I think the basic uh, issue that I have is that we are not thinking enough about how to lower the carbon footprint of buildings. And certainly what you say about the Conservative Party and you know, rebuilding will mean a huge amount of emissions. And why is it that we cannot retrofit? Why is it that we cannot reuse whatever is there? And that's why you know, these uh, particular movements like degrowth and so on are so important now. Because I think we all have to now see how we can try to live with what we have rather than just keep on doing new things. So a person like yourself who writes so much, I think you can really maybe, you know, take these messages forward and, and try to change people's mindsets because that's what we have to do now. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be in deep trouble, I feel. You know, I mean, I'm so old now that I feel maybe it won't be in my lifetime, maybe it won't happen, but I think for the next generation, it's going to be tough, be very tough. So, yeah. Um, yes, I mean, you, you, you made reference to the fact that you need more designers uh, working in areas of poverty and, and uh, um, I mean, certainly in, in British architecture schools, there, there, there's, uh, there are uh, studios which have a kind of focus on uh, working in the global south. And yeah. uh, could, are there, um, are there, is there advice you'd give for uh, uh, people in the UK who have that impulse? Are there good ways or bad ways of going about that ambition? Um, you know, how, how, do, how, how can one sort of, from, from the context of a, a, a British background and education, usefully yeah. engage with, with um, uh, territories, you know, beyond, the, beyond British shores? You know, I think, uh, Alice, there's just so much work out there for it's so many architects because uh, there is a need for good design, as I keep on saying. And uh, of course, you have to understand uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the community, people that you're working with, you have to really forget about your ego and be quite, you know, going with some a sense of humility. But I think what I really need to see is governments and funding agencies uh, putting in money uh, for designers, for architects to go and work in these areas where they go and spend some time and then design because architects themselves cannot just go up and go. I mean, they don't have the resources, obviously, but there is so much money available in humanitarian field, which is wasted. 
because things are done and then shipped over and nobody has really thought about what needs to be done there properly. So the more architects get involved and really the world is shrinking, although traveling might become more difficult, I don't know. But I think people have to go in and, and go around and try to help out each other now because we have to help each other as countries, as people and everything because COVID-19 has, has showed us that really there is no difference between anybody anymore. You know whether it's the south or the north or whatever so uh, i think we need to just work hard on these issues now ellis and you know people like you know yourself and the foundation i think we should be and of course there's um, uh, as we saw uh, harriet is there and, and murad has mentioned and then helen of course writes so much about these things i think we should really try to have a movement of some kind now that's the only way we'll be able to ride this storm and it feels uh, i mean just one of the exciting things, I guess, that has come out of this the last few months is this discovery about how we can all communicate um, through forums yes. like this. Are you optimistic yeah. that that's going to play a bigger role in, in, in your work going forward? Oh, I, I think so. You know, I was very scared of this in the beginning, as you know, when you asked me initially and I said I can't do it because I have no, no idea how well I'll, I'll handle it. But over these uh, months now, I've learned and uh, the biggest thing that's happened and what Murad Jamil mentioned is uh, the tutorials that we are now developing, which will be transferred to, you know, digital means to everybody, because that means that now whatever we prepare can be just spread everywhere through cell phones, maybe even. So if uh, you want to make a really good uh, earth brick, how do you do it? And you know, it'll ha it'll, you'll have it all there and anybody can just follow step by step and make it. So I think this, yeah, yeah, I think it's opened up a huge new world as far as I can see. Absolutely. So a marriage of very high tech and low tech technologies sort of is, is the, <laughs> yeah. where the future lies. Yeah. Um, yes, me, thank you so much. Um, I think unless we have any more comments or questions from the audience, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, let Yasmin go. Uh, but it's been a, a huge honor to, uh, to have you in the program. And I look forward to yes, the moment when Thank we can all travel again and, and, and see, see you for real. Um, I'm going so to unmute. I, I want to thank you, Ellis, and also I want to really thank uh, Murad Jamil and, and Harriet and uh, of course Helen and, and also Oli to be here because I really felt like I was among friends and so that's one, it's a wonderful feeling. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here today. That's super. Thank you so much. Thank um, you, everyone. Thank you. I will allow participants to unmute themselves and then perhaps, oh, oh we have one question come in. We kind of, people do leave these questions late in the day. Sorry. Uh, Constantine, I'm going to um, open up the mic to you. Uh, um, hi, Yasmin. Um, actually, I'm not an architect, but I have a lot of female friends who are architects. And in some region in the world, especially in Indonesia, um, yes. there are a lot of people who dotted uh, the works of female architect. How can we ensure uh, the engineer who are mostly male in Indonesia, like um, to make them appreciate it, what they work. Thank you. That's all. What, what women can do, is that what you're saying? That that's what we have to, uh, you know, somehow convey. You see, uh, sorry, what is your name? I didn't get your name. What is the name? Constant. Uh, sorry, Constant. Oh, Constant. Okay. All right. And you're from Malaysia. Well, I, I think Malaysia in terms of Muslim world is pretty well ahead. So I'm surprised that you're having these difficulties because in Pakistan, I think now there are more women architects than there are men architects. So I think the way to do perhaps is to just uh, make sure that more and more join the force and then, you know, you just put your stamp there. You've got to fight it out. Don't give up. Just just keep on having more and more women join the force and, and uh, you know, you'll be able to put your mark on it. Thanks, Yasmin. Um, I'm going to allow everyone to unmute themselves and then we can have a round of applause. <laughs> Great work, Alice. Great work. Your 100 Day Studio is, a, is an amazing initiative. Thank All you the very best. Much, everybody. Uh, that's been an absolute treat. Um, I, um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you very soon. Take care.